today's main event is Lucy Hines, uh, who's going to be talking about Alberta quilt makers and their quilts. And Lucy and I were, were uh, comparing notes earlier that we've known of each other for years. Uh, we've even attended the same grad program, but we, I don't know if we've met in person, just maybe known of each other for a long time. So it's just really great to have you here, Lucy. And I'm so looking forward to learning more about Alberta quilts. Um, Lucy Hines began researching the history of Alberta quilt makers and their quilts in 2010. We know that it's a really, really rich history in this province. She engaged 38 different museums uh, throughout the province to host public quilt documentation events. The research collected through this process informed her upcoming book, Alberta Quilt Makers and Their Quilts, addressing the gap in the Canadian literature on the history of Alberta quilts. For someone engaged in kind of a complementary project, I can certainly speak to how wide those gaps are. So I'm really looking forward to your book, Lucy. She is the Assistant Curator of Daily Life and Leisure uh, at the Royal Alberta Museum in, in, not Calgary, sorry, in Edmonton. She has an MA in Human Ecology from the University of Alberta, where she majored in the study of clothing and textiles. She's worked on projects at the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C., in Haifa, Israel. She's attended the textile collection at the Baha'i World Center under the care of the Dep Department of Holy Places and is just such a wonderful colleague. Thank you so much for joining us, Lucy. And I will stop sharing and turn this over to you. Thank you all for joining me today as I take you on my journey to capture the history of Alberta quilt makers and their quilts. Of course, this research project was only a small part of what I do at the Royal Alberta Museum. In 2010, the Alberta Quilt Project was initiated to further research the history of quilt making in Alberta. It arose from the work previously done by Sandra Morton Wiseman, then curator of social history at the Provincial Museum of Alberta, now the Royal Alberta Museum, and Elise Elliott Laws, director and curator at the Mutart Gallery Associates, who together researched Alberta quilt makers and quilts for an exhibition aptly called Alberta Quilts. Although not extensive, the research project was the beginning of the museum's work to preserve the history of quilting in Alberta. After the 1984 exhibition, the Royal Alberta Museum became the repository of significant Alberta quilts. Initially, the objective of the Alberta Quilt Project was to examine Alberta quilts and in the process capture the Alberta quilt story. Since very little had been written about Alberta quilts, this was the opportunity to address the gap existing in Canadian literature. However, I was daunted by how I was going to collect their early history. How was I going to find these quilts and capture their stories? Alberta is a large province. Call it procrastination, if you will, but I felt the need to capture the quilting trends of the 21st century quilters first, while they were available to communicate that information to me now. Why wait 100 years to collect that history? And so the Alberta Quilt Project was divided into two phases. Phase one of the Alberta Quilt Project, documenting 21st century Alberta quilters, was completed during the first two and a half years of the project, 2010 to 2012. More than 600 quilters completed a six page questionnaire. The results were shared by quilters and quilt enthusiasts uh, throughout the province and later published in the British Quilt Study Group journal, Quilt Studies. I also had the privilege of presenting my research paper at the 2016 British Quilt Study Group Symposium in Bath, England. Phase two of the project began in Medicine Hat in May 2013 and ended in Rimby in April 2019. 38 museums and quilt guilds participated in the project from as far north as Fort Vermilion to as far south as Cardston.
With the assistance of local quilters, I was able to document and photograph 700 plus quilts found in regional museums as well as in private collections throughout Alberta. The documentations capture the various types of quilts, the materials and the patterns used to create them. The history of the quilt makers were also collected to preserve their contribution to Alberta's quilting history. For each event, the public was invited to bring family quilts made before 1970. They could be quilts that were made elsewhere and brought to Alberta as part of the settlers effects or made in Alberta. These strict parameters permitted me to more effectively tease out the early history of Alberta's quilt makers. By the late 1960s, quilting experienced a resurgence. Chances were likely that more late 20th century quilts would uh, have surfaced had I not limit, limited the time period for the quilt documentation. Unbeknownst to me when I started this research, there had been another quilt documentation project that was conducted in Alberta from 1992 to 1995. This project was init initiated 10 years after the Kentucky Quilt Project was founded in 1981. Kentucky is recognized as being the very first state to document quilts in North America. Conceived by Calgary quilter Gillian Dean in 1991 and launched in 1992, the Alberta Heritage Quilt Project documented more than 1,100 quilts. Under the guidance of project coordinator Sharon Polsky, quilt documentation days were held in communities around Alberta. The Alberta Heritage Quilt Project donated their documentation files to the Royal Alberta Museum in 2012. Many of their documented quilts were included in this presentation. Shortly after I began the Alberta Quilt Project, another local quilt research project was initiated. A group of individuals who wanted to study quilts started the Alberta Quilt Studies Society in Calgary in 2011. The Alberta Quilt Studies Society also organizes quilt documentation days. More than 750 quilts have been documented at this time. Their files will eventually be donated to the Royal Alberta Museum as well. Having all the quilt documentation files in one place will make them easier for researchers to access them in the future. Both the Alberta Heritage Quilt Project and the Alberta Quilt Study Society helped to capture the history of quilts made between 1970 and the year 2000 since documenting quilts made during the last quarter of the 20th century was not included in my project. Now, I must admit that there were times when I wondered if my research would have value. After all, in the eyes of many, quilts are just bed covers. I wondered if anyone would care until I received an email from the Gulp Museum. The owner of the quilt had contacted them regarding a beautiful quilt her mother-in-law had bestowed upon her. It was not until her mother-in-law was on her deathbed that she realized she had never asked about the history of the quilt. Because the quilt had been documented and had an Alberta Heritage Quilt Project label sewn to the back, I was able to retrieve the information and forward it on. The owner replied, quote, thank you so much for this information. Very timely, as my mother-in-law passed away this morning, unquote. This is just one of numerous emails I have received regarding a documented quilt. Through the quilt documentation process, the history of many Alberta quilt makers have been collected, as well as the history of, quilt, um, of making quilts. The story also emphasizes the importance of 21st century quilt makers to label their quilts so that their, their story follows them wherever they go. One cannot speak of the early quilt makers without providing some context of where they came from and what they came to. Many would not have been prepared for the rudimentary existence awaiting them.
When speaking about settlers' migration to Alberta, it is important to acknowledge the impact this movement had on the Indigenous population. In order to clear the way for settlement in Western Canada, the Canadian Crown entered into treaty negotiations with Indigenous peoples. Between 1871 and 1921, Treaties 1 to 11 were signed with Indigenous nations. These treaty, treaties covered territory spanning west from the Quebec border all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Indigenous peoples saw these treaties as a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, solidifying assurances of sharing the land with newcomers. The Crown, however, had other plans. They moved Indigenous peoples onto reserves, which account for less than 3% of their traditional territory, in order to open up land to settlers. By 1872, the Canadian government granted free homesteads to settlers. Edmonton had, just one year earlier, been incorporated as a village. Its population was 148, consisting of fur traders, laborers, a few missionaries, gold prospectors, and some Métis families. In 1896, Canada's Minister of the Interior, Clifford Sifton, implemented a policy aimed at attracting farmers primarily from Central and Eastern Europe. Steamship companies circulated information about 160 acres of free land. Government agents and local businesses promoters recruited settlers at their point of origin. The use of false advertisement aimed to create hype regarding economic developments generated high expectations. Prospective settlers left their homeland eager to start a new life in a land full of opportunities, but many were ill-equipped to deal with the hardships that came with settling the prairies. It must be noted that Minister Sifton's ambitious campaign to populate the West disregarded the fact that thousands of Indigenous people were, would be displaced in the process. The peak period for settling Alberta took place between 1891 and 1914. Edmonton alone grew from 350 people in 1887 to almost 25,000 people in 1911. While Indigenous people outnumbered the settlers eight to one in 1881, at the dawn of the 20th century, they would find themselves outnumbered by the settlers five to one their landscape and their home would forever be changed. For the settlers, their reasons for immigrating to Alberta varied. The Ukrainians and other Central and Northern Europeans came because they were promised free land. The Francophones came west in order to have their own land. In Quebec, land could no longer be divided to support large families. The African-American farmers and ranchers came north to escape the racial segregation of the so-called Jim Crow laws in the American South. And thousands of new settlers were well-established farmers from Ontario, Britain, and the United States. All settlers came with the hope of a better life. They packed up their household belongings and farm, farming equipment from home as much as they could afford to ship with them by rail or wagon. Bedding was never left behind, and this often include, included quilts. If quilts were not brought, the women were soon piecing, stuffing, and tying or quilting them together to provide warmth for their families against Alberta's bitter cold winters. The following are the stories of quilts that came as part of the settlers' effects or made shortly after settling in Alberta. In 1904, Myrtle Buttorf made the red and white quilt at the age of 18 as part of her trousseau while living in Indiana. It is not known why she came to Alberta, but we do know that she was married in Edmonton three years later on June 30th, 1907. The present owner of the quilt, Myrtle's granddaughter, was not able to provide very much family history. This was the case for many of the quilts documented. Already three generations later, important information about quilt makers is lost. Beverly and her husband immigrated from Kentucky, United States. 
In a covered wagon, they traveled with a team of horses, a cow, a hundred pounds of flour, and a hundred dollars. They settled in Black Spring Ridge, which later became Carmen Gay, Alberta. The farm remained in the family for three generations until the early 1980s. This crazy quilt was made of mini wool fabric pieces. Beverly secured each piece using a variety of embroidery stitches. She also uh, added decorative floral designs. The letters JLS, JMS, and DVS are embroidered on three separate blocks. Since these initials end in S, it is possible that three other members of the Snell family contributed blocks for the quilt. The year 1904 was also embroidered. Initials and dates are the earliest forms of labeling quilts. These are most often seen on crazy quilts. The carded wool used as batting for the quilt came from the sheep Beverly raised. She won first prize at every country fair in which this quilt was entered. The crazy quilt is an excellent example of Beverly's needlework skills. Crazy quilts were believed to have been inspired by English embroidery and the Japanese crack glaze pottery on exhibition at the Centennial International Exhibition in 1876. It was the first official World's Fair to be held in the United States, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Crazy quilts were more fiber art rather than functional bed quilts, often displayed in a parlor setting. The goal was to have as many different embroidery stitches within the quilt to demonstrate one's needlework abilities. This whole cloth quilt was given to Sarah Lamb and James Murray on the occasion of their marriage on May 18, 1907. The couple was married in England before immigrating to Canada. They made their way to Toefield, where they were employed by George Trent of the Trent Ranch located north of Toefield. They worked at the ranch until they were able to purchase their own farm. The beauty of the whole cloth quilt is the intricate hand quilted motifs used to embellish the quilt. The quilt maker used floral, feathering, vines, and wreath motifs to great effect. Granddaughter Joan remembers the quilt uh, was on a bed in a spare room at her grandparents' house. Quilt maker Lulu York and John Foote were married in Roscoe, New York in 1905. As land was opening up in the West, John and his father decided to investigate and bought a quarter section in the Grassy Lake area east of Tabor, Alberta. They returned to liquidate their business and prepared to move West. In March 1913, Lulu, her little daughter Irene, and John's parents traveled West by CPR coach to their new home. John arrived sometime later on the freight, bringing their household goods and uh, no doubt uh, included the log cabin quilt. Their first shack, as they called it, was on the north end of the half section, but it was moved further south where water was available. The shack was incorporated into a uh, 30 foot by 30 foot two story house with five bedrooms. Many weary travelers were given shelter when required. It was also home for some uh, school teachers. Lulu was often host to the government extension classes and for the classes themselves, which benefited the women of, with the women of the neighborhood. Lulu was interested in community activities and could always be counted on for a cake or a box of sandwiches. Lulu also made many quilts in her lifetime, especially for her grandchildren. Quilt maker August Lang was born in Hanover, Germany in 1885. In the spring of 1905, she and her husband emigrated to Alberta, settling in Claire's home. The quilt was made for her youngest son, Ottomar, the year he started school. He was the youngest of 11 children. The family spoke only German at home, so August thought that if Ottoman learned these English nursery rhymes, then perhaps he would get along better with the language. This quilt tells of a special love a mother had for her child. 
William and Maddie Allen were the first African Americans to settle in Keystone, Alberta in 1909. They were soon joined by Matilda and her husband, Will Bailey, who came to Canada from Kansas in 1910. Matilda and Will traveled together with his two brothers, Robert and Ben, her mother, Mrs. Bartlett, their son, Big Eddie, and the Harding brothers, Tom and Jim. They first came to Edmonton before settling in Keystone in 1911. Mrs. Bartlett eventually returned to Kansas, finding the Alberta winters too cold. In 1918, tragedy hit the small community. The flu epidemic took the lives of Will Bailey and Tom Harding. Matilda later married Willis Day and gave birth to their daughter, Gwen. The quilt blocks were made at two different times. The red and white blocks are believed to have been made prior to Matilda's immigration to Alberta. The fabric suggests the blocks were made before 1910 and may have remained at the bottom of a trunk until the 1930s when Matilda decided to complete the quilt using more contemporary fabrics. The colorful 1930s fabrics were used to make the remaining blocks years after settling in Keystone. The juxtaposition between the red and white blocks and the 1930s fabric blocks provides an element of surprise. In this improvis improvised asymmetry, it is reminiscent of the distinctive style of a G's Bend quilt. G's Bend is an isolated African-American community in Alabama whose inhabitants are the descendants of slaves. The women have always made quilts for their families. Their style of quilting evoked uh, artistic improv improvisation, and the quilts themselves are considered important visual and cultural contributions to art. I often wonder if Matilda had been exposed to this style of quilting while growing up in Kansas. In Alberta, scraps have always been used to make quilts. In some cases, quilt makers made quilts in order to use up uh, scraps collected from sewing projects and worn out clothes. Making quilts from scraps sometimes determined what kind of quilt pattern were used. Coats, suiting fabric samples, and men's retired suits made warm, heavy utility quilts. Silk fabrics were ideal for making decorative or pictorial quilts used for special occasions or for show. The following quilts are examples of how Alberta quilters use scraps to great effect. There is not much information regarding the reason for making the Roman stripes quilt. We do know the quilt maker, Aditha Fairbairn, made the quilt in Drumheller in 1922. She made it from remnants of silk dresses and her husband William's silk ties. According to Aditha's um, granddaughter, her grandpa loved his silk ties and obviously he had some to spare. The whole quilt top was pieced by hand using foundation black blocks. The seam uh, lines are embroidered using herringbone and cross stitches. The overall effect of this quilt is stunning. Margaret Ignatius made this crazy quilt while living in Medicine Hat sometime during the 1920s. Based on the quilts documented, the crazy quilt was the most popular to make for Alberta quilt makers. This style of quilt was ideal for using up all different shapes of scrap fabric. By the time Margaret made her quilt, Alberta quilt makers were less in inclined to use a variety of embroidery stitches to embellish their quilt, but rather used one embroidery stitch, predominantly the herringbone or feather stitch, to keep the scraps in place on the foundation squares. Unlike the lavishly embroidered crazy quilts made during the Victoria, Victorian era, Alberta quilt makers made their crazy quilts functional quilts as opposed to artistic pieces for display. It should be noted that crazy quilts are rarely quilted. Quilting stitches would interfere with the embroidery stitches. Moreover, since crazy quilts rarely had batting, only ties were necessary to keep the top and backing together. Scraps worked well 
uh, for making one patch quilts like grandmother's flower garden. Four and nine patch quilts also worked well. Scraps could be separated into dark and light colors and used to make a number of log cabin quilt variations. All of these quilts were popular during the first quarter of the 20th century, when money was more likely to be directed towards the establishment of a homestead or the building of a house in town. Any fabric purchase was likely for making clothes for every member of the family, and only scraps could be spared for quilting. Quilt maker Francis Luce made this quilt while living on the farm east of McGrath, Alberta. In a letter to her grandson, she tells the quilt story as follows. Quote, years ago, my mother belonged to the Farm Hill Women's Institute, and they made things for the Red Cross during the war. They made a quilt to raffle off to make money to buy flannelette to make pajamas and things for the Red Cross. I won the quilt, and the quilt you have was made in the same pattern as the one I won. The top was made from pieces from my and my mother's scrap bags. I made others, but they are all gone. Yours is the only one still in existence. While the quilt campaign during the First World War was devoted to making fundraiser signature quilts to raise funds for the Red Cross, the quilters' efforts were redirected during the Second World War to making comfort quilts. These were sent over, overseas to Britain to aid with the war relief. Bombed out families, members of the armed forces, hospitals and hostels were all the recipients of these quilts. Quilts were made quickly due to the urgent need for quilts overseas and to meet the monthly quotas set by the local Red Cross societies. The local women's groups and organizations acting as auxiliaries to the Red Cross worked tirelessly to meet these quotas. By the end of the war, Alberta quilters had made over 43 thousand quilts. And although Alberta witnessed this impressive period of quilt making, very few of these quilts can be found in Canada because they are all in Europe. And how interesting to discover that our quilts are being studied in England, as I discovered in 2016 while attending the British Quilt Study Group Symposium. The Canadian Red Cross Research Group in the UK was formed by Maxine March, Jackie Maxwell, and Dr. Anna Mansi. The latter is the author of a book entitled Comfort from Kindness, World War II Canadian Red Cross Quilts, published in 2016, coinciding with the exhibition of 40 Canadian Red Cross quilts in London, England. With the passing of Dr. Mansi, Maxine and Jackie continue to collect document and research Canadian Red Cross quilts. Maxine was instrumental in providing me with information for my soon to be published book on Alberta quilt makers and their quilts. Who would have thought that I would have to reach out to England to get a photo of a Canadian Red Cross quilt label? There is not uh, a lot of information about the labels, but there is evidence that labels such as Edmonton, Alberta and Province of Alberta were in use. It is believed that a standard label that read gift of the Canadian Red Cross Society was eventually adopted. In 2004, the Royal Alberta Museum received a donation of an unverified Red Cross quilt from British quilt collector Sally Ward. It lacks a Red Cross label as many recipients would remove them, uh, but its pink strippy flannel backing commonly associated with Red Cross quilts suggests that it is. Since putting quilt makers names on the Red Cross quilts were forbidden, embroidering Alberta, Canada on its border was a clever way to let the recipient know where it came from, further intimating that it is a Red Cross quilt. Retired curator Kathy Roy, who accepted the quilt, said that Ms. Ward emphasized the importance of these quilts. Whenever Ms. Ward has been able to find an original owner, they have told her how much the color and pattern on the quilts meant to them, aside from the physical warmth. The quilts were utilitarian, made mostly from donated scraps. 
The Gleichen Red Cross Society reported at their annual meeting, quote, the Great Western Garment Company sent us free of charge a large bundle of new materials, also two boxes of quilt scraps from Emory Company in Edmonton. The ShopRite store also have given us quilt scraps, unquote. Farmers donated wool and the Red Cross provided the striped pink flannel for the backing and a label to sew on the back of the quilt. According to Maxine March, women often had to be inventive in finding suitable backings if the striped pink flannel was not available. The Canadian Red Cross Research Group in the UK has seen quilts with stri striped backing in blues, yellows, and greens. How wonderful that this research group is collecting our Second World War quilt history at a time when quilters were most prolific and we have but one quilt to show for it. Many wedding quilts appeared during the quilt documentation events. Some were in pristine condition, possibly never used because they were considered too special for everyday use, while others were well worn. Young women made wedding quilts as part of their trousseau, and the bride's mother or grandmother made a quilt as a wedding gift. Wedding quilts were often among the settlers' effects because it was common for newlyweds to immigrate to Alberta shortly after being married elsewhere. Quilts celebrating wedding anniversaries were also documented. They marked milestones such as the 1st, 10th, 25th, 50th, and even 60th wedding anniversaries. These quilts were usually made by the quilt maker for herself or as a gift to her husband. The few red and green wedding quilts documented predate Alberta's settlement period of 1895 to 1914. These quilts were very popular to make between 1850 and 1885 in Eastern Canada and the United States. Red and green applique quilts were often made for special occasions due to the laborious work involved. Martha is believed to have made this quilt near the end of this trend. It was hand pieced and hand quilted. It was sent as a wedding gift in 1905 to her granddaughter, Re Washburn Ernst, who had settled in Brant, Alberta with her mother Alice the previous year. Alice Washburn, according to the family, was the first woman to be granted a homestead in Alberta. Lois Schmidt was born in South Dakota in 1921. We don't know when she came to Alberta, but the quilt documentation notes that the source for the cross-stitch rose pattern was the Family Herald and Weekly Magazine, a Canadian publication serving rural Canada. Therefore, Lois was living in Alberta at the time that she made the quilt. She did the cross-stitched roses from 1938 to 1939 and finished quilting it in 1941. She made the quilt for her hope chest. Hence, she must have moved to Alberta with her family. Lois was married June 16, 1942. She became a farm wife and participated in local activities such as the choir, the horticultural society, hospital auxiliary, and served on the uh, county fair board. In 1902, Martha and her husband, Moses Kelsey, ventured north from North Dakota to settle and file homestead papers for Southeast 4-45-18. The town of Kelsey was established on the southeast corner of this quarter of land. It was Milton Zimmerman, also a settler to the area, which suggested the community be named after Kelsey. Martha made the quilt as a wedding quilt, uh, gift for her granddaughter Gwendolyn McCarty von Custer and her husband Quincy. It is hand pieced and hand quilted using echo and single parallel lines inserting hearts as a decorative element. The double wedding ring pattern was very popular during the 1930s and 1940s. The dress and plate pattern made its appearance during the 1920s. 
The quilt pattern uh, was uh, the second most popular pattern used in Alberta after the crazy quilt during the 20th century. Anna Roy made this quilt as a wedding gift for her daughter, Cecile, who married in uh, 1959. Quilt maker Samantha Shantz made this wedding quilt for her granddaughter Sylvia in 1962. She was 72 years of age at the time. Samantha loved making quilts. She would order remnants that were predominantly pink and blue from the Eaton's catalog. Although she used a simple nine patch pattern to make the quilt, she took great care to outline each block and quilt a diamond grid. The sashing was quilted with a cable motif. Quilt maker Pauline Beats was born in 1924 in the small community of Maybutt, one kilometer north of Sterling in so uh, southern Alberta. At the age of 16, she met the love of her life, Alvin Beats, who was already heading off to serve in the Royal Canadian Air Force during the Second World War. While he was away, Pauline moved to Toronto to work as a riveter building aircrafts. Upon Alvin's return, they were married and made, uh, made Calgary their home. There they raised four daughters. Pauline was known to be a wonderful mother and homemaker and, and had a remarkable talent for sewing. She had a keen sense of style and kept her daughters dressed in fashionable clothing. She was also a quilter. These four Lone Star quilts were made for each of her daughters as wedding uh, quilts. The reason Pauline chose to make the same pattern for each of her daughters is because she herself had made the Lone Star quilt as part of her trousseau for her own wedding. What is evident is that wedding quilts were all unique, reflecting the quilt maker's creativity and the resources that were available to them. In 1882, the Edmonton Bulletin reported on what was possibly the earliest documented uh, agricultural exhibition in Alberta. According to the Bulletin, quote, the McDonald and Company's new hotel served as an agricultural hall. Donald McLeod's uh, corral held the loose stock, unquote. There were 180 entries and 200 to 300 people attended from the Edmonton and surrounding area. This was good attendance considering that Edmonton's population was between 148 and 263 based on the 1848 and 1885 census respectively. The exhibition included the showing of livestock, field grain and seeds, vegetables, preserved fruits and dairy products. There were also non-agricultural categories such as black, blacksmithing, leatherwork, needlework and homemade woolen goods. Patchwork quilts were part of the latter category. In 1884, Calgary officially became a city and the Calgary District and Agricultural Society was formed. They organized and held their first exhibition in 1886, four years after Edmonton's first exhibition. By 1908, the gradual success of the Calgary exhibition positioned itself to be awarded the Dominion Exhibition, a federally funded traveling fair. The event included the Miller Brothers 101 Wild West Show. Guy Wittick, a trick writer from New York, was quite inspired by his time spent in Calgary. He envisioned staging a Frontier Days and Cowboy Championship contest, which would eventually take place four years later. Wittig returned to Calgary in the spring of 1912 to secure funding for this event. He was introduced to four rancher businessmen interested in sponsoring the event, Patrick Burns, A.E. Cross, uh, George Lane, and A.J. McLean. And so the first Calgary Stampede and Exhibition was held in September of 1912. Much like previous exhibitions, livestock, grains, vegetables, and handmade items were being judged. The prize-winning quilt to receive a first-place ribbon at the 1912 
Calgary Stampede was made by Mrs. J.B. Gansoli. She made the crazy quilt in 1911. The prize-winning quilt is now part of the Royal Alberta Museum's collection. Over time, local country fairs were held annually in many small towns throughout Alberta. Farm wives liked to show their garden produce and their needlework skills. It was also a social event to look forward to. For Alberta quilt makers, the winter months were always a good time to work on a special quilt for the fair. There is not a lot of information about this grandmother's fan quilt. What is known is that it was made by Pearl Newfield and her mother, Maggie Stauffer. It won first prize at the Westward Ho Women's Institute Quilt Show in 1955. It is not known when quilt maker Edith Pierce and her husband Frederick immigrated from England to uh, Edmonton, but we do know that they were homesteading in the Highlands area when she made the daffodil applique quilt in 1965. It won first prize at the Edmonton exhibition. Her granddaughter remembers her grandmother's quilt frame taking up the whole living room of her little house. Edith made quilts for all the members of her family. She also participated in a quilting group at her church. Inez Harris loved to quilt. She said, quote, I was raised under a quilt and on the end of the treadle sewing machine, unquote. Her mother was a great quilter and made many quilts for their home. With a family of nine children, many quilts were required. Inez remembers how she would buy uh, sheep pelts, wash them, remove the wool, then card it into bats, which she would use them for quilts. Inez was uh, called upon to go from door to door to invite, invite the ladies to a quilting bee. Inez made her first quilt at the age of eight using suiting samples. She graduated to using block patterns to make her quilts. Then Inez discovered applique. This became her favorite type of quilting. The girl on a swing is both hand appliqued and hand quilted. Marianne Lee was born in Germany. She immigrated to Calgary with her family in 1927. She married uh, in 1934 and lived in Millet and Wetaskiwin before settling in Edmonton. She made many quilts and won many ribbons for her fine work. To celebrate Alberta's 75th anniversary, Marianne decided to make a quilt with all the ribbons she won during the 1960s and 1970s. Red denotes first place, blue is for second place, and white is third place. The ribbons with the rosettes are from the Calgary Stampede, and the simple ribbons are from the Edmonton Contact Day Days exhibit. At a glance, it's easy to see that Marianne was a prize winning quilt maker. The quilt documentation events have provided a lot of information about Alberta quilt makers. Of all the quilts documented, less than 0.03% of quilters were men. More men may have quilted during the 20th century, but their quilts were not documented to provide that information. There is evidence that men quilted during the 20th century, that they were co-creators with their wives or mothers, and of course, men were the recipients of quilts. Lawrence Jackson made a baby quilt while his wife, Ima Nell Jackson, was bedridden during pregnancy with their daughter, Penny. Each evening upon his return home from working in the oil fields in Oklahoma, he would prepare food for his wife and keep her company. It was, uh, if they were not playing cards or board games, he was making the quilt while they talked. When Lawrence's daughter, Penny Jackson was pregnant with her first child, she and her husband decided, quote, rather than telling them, her parents, I'm pregnant, we decided to say, Dad, we need you to make another quilt. And he did. Lawrence's grandson, 
uh, still has his baby quilt after all these years. Husband and wife Milton and uh, Ethel Souter were well-known quilters to the Edmonton area. They both learned to quilt from Kate Souter, Milton's mother, who was a prolific quilter. Milton usually cut the pieces and Ethel did the piecing and quilting. This dynamic duo made many quilts, sometimes up to nine per year. This quilt won the 1987 Canada Packers Quilt Competition. From 1980 to 1989, Canada Packers Inc., now Maple Leaf Foods Inc., sponsored an annual national quilt competition. Communities throughout all the provinces were encouraged to host local quilt competitions. The first place winning quilts, one from each community, were then assembled for a traveling exhibit. Canada Packers provided carrying cases and display units for transporting and displaying the provincial winning quilts around the province. The storm at sea pattern is pieced using straight edge shapes, yet it offers an optical illusion. Overall, it looks like there are curves or wave-like shapes. This quilt was made for John Poetker, uh, as a token of appreciation for his services, John drove a bus every Sunday, picking up the Sunday school children from the Marlboro area, 25 kilometers west of Edson. On each quilt are embroidered family names and that of the children that benefited from John's service. Frida, the pastor's wife, assembled the quilt. It was quilted with the help of three ladies from the women's sewing circle. In 1999, John's daughter, Marion, inherited his quilt. Unlike uh, to, until 2017, Marion knew very little about the quilt. After the quilt was documented, Marion was on a quest to find out more about her father's quilt. Her journey led her to Frida and the quilt's story. The research information and stories you have just heard about Alberta quilt makers and their quilts are just a sampling of what has been collected over the years by the Alberta Quilt Project, the Alberta Heritage Quilt Project, and the Alberta Quilt Study Society. And I might add that many of the quilt stories I shared with you today are not in my book. I am delighted to have had the opportunity to assemble some of the best examples of Alberta quilts in a book that not only captures uh, quilt making in Alberta, but also tells the province's history through the lives of the quilt makers. It includes 12 significant stories about quilt makers made possible because of unpublished memoirs, diaries, and letters provided by families, and 12 themes such as I've presented today. As many of you may know, um, this book was originally to be published last summer. However, there were some unforeseen delays in the process because of the pandemic. The publisher, the Friends of the Royal Alberta Museum Society, anticipate launching pre-order sales of this book very, very soon. I encourage you to go to their website to sign in so that you receive notification when pre-orders are available. So thanks again for joining me to learn more about Alberta quilt makers and their quilts. Lucy, that was that was fantastic. Um, what a what a wealth of knowledge you are and um, what what fabulous stories and beautiful, beautiful artifacts you shared. I can't wait for your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you that yesterday I held an advanced copy in my hands. So it has been printed. It's just a matter of um, when it's going to be launched, which, as I mentioned, will be very, very soon. Congratulations. Thank you. That's, that's quite an achievement. Um, we are right at one, but if anybody would like to... Uh, would like to ask a question. This is this is the moment. I know I have lots of textile lovers on the list there. People are being shy. 
well, if no one's going to volunteer, uh, then Michelle will ask a question. <laughs> Lucy, your, 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 your research and your topic has been quilts in Alberta. Mm -hmm. If you were to step back uh, and maybe compare it to quilts made in other places, how do the quilts of Alberta, you know, what makes an Alberta quilt? Is it something that is recognizable? Um, or is that not a fair question? You know, initially, um, that was one of the things that I thought I would um, would get through this research is what makes uh, Alberta quilts distinctive mm -hmm. from quilts elsewhere. And, and actually, there isn't um, a lot of difference. I think in terms of the materials, I think because here in Alberta and, and probably any uh, place else in Canada where we experience uh, harsher winters, mm -hmm. um, we do tend to have more of the utility quilts, the, the wool quilts. Um, the fact that the, the, um, the batting, um, we, that was the one thing that we, we could raise sheep. We couldn't, you know, um, harvest cotton. So any cotton that we uh, would use in a quilt had to be uh, imported from, um, from elsewhere uh, where cotton was uh, available. Um, so I think certainly, you know, Alberta and I'm sure other areas, other provinces um, in Canada, we would have more of the warmer quilts um, mm -hmm. that was necessary in order to, um, you know, to get through the, the cold winters uh, when uh, we didn't have the, um, you know, central heating and, and even those that had central heating was not as um, efficient as they are today. The houses weren't um, insulated as well as they are today. So um, I think that is um, some of the, one of them, I think the main difference between like, quilts from the states, let's say. Um, but to, to, to say that we do something really distinctive um, in looking at other history books of quilts that were made in, in the states and there are books in Eastern Canada, we're seeing the same sort of patterns. Those patterns were being shared. The names of the patterns could change. Uh, mm -hmm. It was interesting that um, the Dresden plate, which we, certainly here in Alberta referred to as Dresden plate um, uh, would be called um, uh, China plate or um, broken dishes. Um, they would have a different name elsewhere. So that's where there would be some differences. Well, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe flipping that around, what's, you know, what's significant here is not how different Alberta was, but how plugged in weavers were. Right, and I think for me, what I found very surprising is based on the quilts that were documented that the crazy quilt was the most popular quilt uh, mm -hmm. to make, but it made sense in terms of they weren't going out purchasing fabrics. It was whatever scraps they had. And that style of quilt certainly lend, lended itself to just using scraps and what they did with it. Yeah. 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 We do have a couple of questions that have come in okay. and I can keep you just another moment, Lucy. Sure. Um, is the RAM still accepting quilts for their collection? Uh, we are, yes. We, um, I mean, we want to continue to, uh, to collect quilts, both uh, heritage quilts, and uh, we have started collecting some contemporary uh, quilts as well. Um, you know, museums now look at um, contemporary collecting to capture what is happening now. And certainly through uh, my process of uh, documenting contemporary um, 21st century quilters, I felt it necessary to um, at least start collecting some of those quilts um, while uh, I could. Um, yeah. Exciting. I know, mm -hmm. I know Ram has been out there collecting pussycat hats and all sorts of <laughs> yes. interesting contemporary mm -hmm. textiles. Um, 
and I, I and I think we have to say this is the last question, but it's a good one. Besides the red Cro red cross quilts project you mentioned, were there any other large cooperative quilting projects in Alberta that you've discovered in your research? Um, one of the things that as I was traveling um, around Alberta doing this project and meeting with quilters locally, um, I mean, quilters are known to um, uh, to do a lot of charity quilts. Um, they are such a giving community. It, it just amazes me. And um, certainly another way of using, you know, additional scraps, um, even though quilt makers uh, today, um, you, most of them, eight, more than 80% will purchase fabric, but you always end up with scraps in the end. And then those scraps get used up to make other quilts. Um, but, you know, you would have certain groups that were, they did, um, you know, quilts for the hospitals or for cancer patients. Like they had their specific sort of niche of you know, what kind of quilts that they did. And they continue to make quilts for fundraising um, to raise funds for um, uh, events or projects within their, their community. Uh, and I often thought, you know, I wish the quilters could see what I see. I had the privilege of being, because I was traveling and meeting all the quilters, you know, quilting guilds deal within their small community. Um, and, and even, you know, like, I know I was surprised when I found out Calgary has many quilt guilds, uh, whereas Edmonton, I think, has definitely one, I think maybe two now. Um, but to, you know, you, they're so focused on what they're doing that they're not realizing that they're part of this, this provincial movement, uh, which is also na national, nationally wide as well. But, you know, that just to see them as Alberta quilters and, and just all the the efforts that they um, have put into making quilts for others and, and to continue to contribute to their communities as um, women uh, have always done in the past. I bet they really loved having you there and talking about things that are so close to their hearts and their family histories and connections. Well, and I learned a lot from other quilters. I mean, there were, uh, I met many quilters that are far more experienced than I am. And, and some that came from backgrounds where their mother and their grandmother quilted. And so they were, they, you know, these quilters were able to impart, you know, information to me about quilting. And, and often when I would go and do these quilt documentation and they would look to me as being the expert. And I would remind them that, if anything has made me an expert in Alberta quilts is because I had the privilege of meeting so many other quilters in Alberta. And without, um, without that, I wouldn't have the expertise that, that I, I do have today. And I don't believe that I um, have all the knowledge. I'm constantly learning. There's always something new to learn uh, regarding quilts. Maybe there are other international scholars that are studying Alberta quilts right now. Absolutely. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. And you uh, will have lots to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lucy. What a, fan what a fantastic presentation. Um, we really enjoyed it. It was lovely to have you here. You and I, I could talk to you for hours and we will <laughs> eventually. Uh, yes. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the cleaned up video will be posted hopefully within a week. Um, and Lucy, if you can send me the link to your book when it's available, we'll make sure to share that as well. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Have a great Thursday, everybody.